Good. I'm going to tell you today about a particle-based method for modeling. Uh, someone yesterday said that uh, particle-based modelings uh, w w wouldn't uh, be suitable for whole cell modeling. I'd like to convince you today that, in fact, it scales up very nicely uh, and, and perhaps even much better than uh, traditional finite element approaches. Not that you that say that uh, you only need to choose one. You obviously need to do hybrids. So the nervous system uh, really uh, certainly has a scale problem. Uh, there are 11 orders of magnitude of spatial scale here, and there are structures and interesting problems at each one of them. I'm going to be focusing down here at the bottom uh, at the level of neurons, synapses, and molecules. And Phil Bourne mentioned, you know, we really need to have a target. The target we picked was the synapse, and, and there are strategic reasons for that. First of all, there are an awful lot of them. Every neuron has about 10 to the fourth, 1 to 10,000 synapses. Uh, Purkinje cells, 10 to the fifth. So there's a, there's a lot on each cell. There's a lot of high degree of connectivity. In the entire brain, there are 10 to the 14th and 10 to the 15th. So this is an enormously uh, large number, astronomical. And that's, of course, the, the reason why the brain has computational capabilities that it has. And particularly, the, the function that we're interested in targeting is plasticity how it is that synapses are able to change their strengths and dynamic properties over time in response to activity and experience. And of course, that ultimately will allow us, we hope, to explain changes in behavior at the very top of the central nervous system. This is a slide from Mary Kennedy. We're collaborating very closely with her lab. She's a biochemist at Caltech, and she studies a number of molecules uh, in the postsynaptic density. So uh, the uh, the story of the synapse, to go back here, is that uh, here's a little uh, presynaptic terminal. Each of these vesicles is, contains about 2,000 molecules of glutamate in the case of excitatory synapses in the hippocampus and the cortex. And when one is released, uh, the 2,000 molecules of glutamate diffuse over to the postsynaptic cell where they bind to receptors, glutamate receptors, where they then uh, open ion channels and uh, activate intracellular second messenger systems. So this is the, the, the chemical synapse that uh, the, the primary uh, driver of signal processing between neurons. Uh, so in the postsynaptic uh, cell, here's the membrane, and, uh, in, in, and below that there's uh, a very dense uh, mat of protein, very, very tough uh, biochemically, with hundreds of different types of proteins. And this is just a handful of the ones that have been studied. But the uh, ones in particular that we're interested in are, first of all, the glutamate receptors, the fast AMPA receptor, millisecond time scale, the NMDA receptor, which when uh, glutamate binds, uh, opens a channel that lets calcium through, uh, and that's uh, hundreds of milliseconds. And then here's the metabotropic receptors, so a variety of receptors. And just below the surface are these uh, very large molecules, and in particular, CAM kinase 2, which uh, we're going to be focusing on. Now, uh, let, let's look at numbers, okay? I told you there are 2,000 glutamate molecules. Well, that's not a large number. I mean, you know, that's, you can handle that. You can count that. How many receptors are there? Well, a, a hundred, a few hundred. Again, that's not very much. One of the most important things that drives plasticity is entry of calcium through the NMDA receptor. Well, what's the resting level of calcium in the postsynaptic uh, cell here, in, especially in that spine that we're, you're going to see in a minute? Well, 200 nanomolar in a very small volume, the average number of free calcium ions is seven plus or minus three. So this is really getting down to very fine granularity. So biology is really taking things down to single molecule level. And that makes particle-based methods very attractive. And the reason is you can't even define concentration when you get down to numbers that small. And you can't, if you have voxels that are small, sometimes there's one molecule in it, sometimes there's none. What's the concentration? There is no concentration. Uh, however, uh, we, we, we have a, a different problem on our hand, and that has to do with uh, CAM kinase 2. So it's a dodecamer, and uh, if you, this is looking at it from above, and this is looking at it from the side, and so you can see these dimers that are formed, uh, a ring of six hexagon on the top and the bottom. And uh, working with Mary Kennedy, uh, we've been trying to model this molecule, and here's the problem. Uh, it has many, many states. It has uh, a large number of phosphorylation sites. It has a modulin binding site. Calmodulin is a calcium binding molecule. 
that binds four calciums, and depending on which, how many calcium are bound, it will have different effects when it binds to calmodulin. And, it, it, and there's uh, conformation changes, there's cooperativity between subunits. Uh, when calmodulin cal binds to one, it'll affect the affinity of calmodulin for the next one. If you add up all of the different possible states that chemkinase 2 can be in, you get an even more astronomical number, 10 to the 21st possible states. And if you're following the traditional way of writing down differential equations for all the reactions, that would give you 10 to the 23rd reactions. So here we go from the sm very small numbers to astronomical numbers, and we're trying to integrate that together. How can we possibly solve this problem? I mean, it, it certainly we're not going to do it with differential equations, right? We've got to find some other way of doing it. So I hope to convince you by the end of the talk that the approach that we're taking actually can help uh, with that problem. So we're going to focus on a particular synapse, and it's the best study synapse physiologically in terms of long-term potentiation. That's the process whereby if you stimulate the synapse at a high frequency, you strengthen the synapse very rapidly and for a long term. Uh, this is from uh, Cajal, who uh, was an anatomist at the turn of the cent uh, 1900s, who uh, was able to draw the circuit that actually leads to information processing through the hippocampus. A particular area here we're going to focus on is called the CA1 area. And we, uh, this little volume here is, is uh, five microns on a side. And if you do an EM, you can see the cross-section. This is an apical dendrite. This is a synapse, a presynaptic terminal, a postsynaptic spine head. And uh, in collaboration with Chandra Bajaj and Kristen Harris, who did the EM, uh, we were able to do a reconstruction in my lab, Justin Kinney. Uh, first, the segmentation was done by Kristen. And uh, Chandra helped us with the computational geometry for doing the correspondence between these planes, which are separated by 40 nanometers. And with that, we were able to reconstruct every single process, every single dendrite, uh, two shown here, axon. There are over 400 synapses. We used M cell in order to be able to show the uh, random walk uh, uh, by using uh, diffusion, by using a random walk algorithm. The idea is you have a lot of prop, uh, random numbers. Uh, we used uh, biochemical uh, reactions, the rates of opening and closing of the channels uh, when it binds the transmitter, and realistic geometry from the reconstruction. So we're taking anatomy, physiology, and biochemistry, two sep three separate areas, and putting it together into this model that I'm now going to demonstrate for you. Try that again. Well, um, <clears throat> what you would have seen is the uh, release of transmitter, and you'd have seen the random walk and Brownian motion. But uh, here's another simulation of the release of transmitter. Uh, these, these are glutamate molecules in white. Uh, when it binds to the glial cells in yellow, it uh, glutamate transporters. You may hear some music in the background. Uh, it will, uh, the, the, it's going to speed up. This is a logarithmic time scale. Each of these little blocks here is a postsynaptic density. There are 400 of them in this block of tissue. So that was one release, and that's about a millisecond later. Now here's a second release. So you can see that uh, the glutamate doesn't go too far before it binds to the uh, glutamate transporters on the glial cells. So this is a burst of activity coming from CA3 into CA1, uh, something called a sharp wave. There's another release. Now as time is speeding up, there's going to be more releases. So this whole time scale here is just 100 milliseconds. Okay, uh, so that was just to give you a feeling of what it's, what it's possible to do now. We could simulate a block of tissue and all of the synapses in it. 
uh, both the release, very detailed models, very detailed models of uh, the receptors and postsynaptic densities. And there's a chain of, of biochemical reactions that take place when calcium enters the postsynaptic cell that leads ultimately to changes in the size of the synapse, the number of receptors in the synapse, and then on the postsynaptic and the presynaptic side, an increase in the probability of release. And all of those things are within reach of simulation. There's nothing that, no barrier that we can see except time and effort. Uh, we think the very same approach can be applied to any signaling pathway. Just, again, there's no barrier except time and effort. And uh, ultimately, this should be scalable. Uh, it's by parallel computing. Uh, you can put a block of tissue. Uh, you can take a, a block of space and put it in different processors and have them communicate particles as they go back and forth. Uh, I just want to emphasize that this is a team effort. Tom Bartol is res the, uh, responsible for uh, M-cell and uh, the guiding the experiments. Uh, the presynaptic side, uh, you didn't have, I didn't have a chance to show you that simulation. Uh, Justin, uh, Kristen, Mary, and Chandra, thank you. <laughs>